Good evening, good evening, good evening. It is Wednesday night. It is the 2nd of October. It is a week until it'll be the day after plenary in the European Parliament will have voted on electronic cigarettes. And tonight, I'm blessed, we're blessed. I have three of my favorite people with me tonight. Uh, I'm going to go through, I'm going to, I was going to try and do this like Tim talk, but I can't do Tim. I just can't do Tim. So I'll do them in the order in which you see them. We'll start with my oppo, the uh, bountilicious babe, the effervescent loveliness that is the one and only Sav. Good evening to you, Sav. How are you doing? Good evening, dear. I'm fine. And how are you? Um, I'm very pleased that I managed to get that out without stuttering, if I'm true, <laughs> true to myself, because the, uh, yes, the old brain and the mouth are not very well attached tonight, so if I'm falling all over myself, I do apologise. But in, in the smaller screen, looking, we think, a little like an angel, well, actually a lot like an angel, uh, we have what I like to, re or a person I like to refer to, was the godfather of harm reduction. And I think, I'm, I'm not alone in regarding him that way, because a few people I spoke to yesterday confirmed that. And that's Jerry Stimson. How are you doing, Jerry? I'm fine, and I've never been called an angel before, so whatever the appearance is, I won't going to take them. I'm not going to take that too literally. Well, you've just, if you look at the screen, you've got this little halo coming away from your head, and the white, yeah. I, mind you've got eyes like a pope, but I'm not going to go any further than that. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in the big monitor tonight, um, a guy who has, it has to be said, driven a lot of what's been going on uh, with respect to the Tobacco Products Directive, a man who we think is indefatigable <laughs> that means he's got a lot of energy um, and both jerry and i would like to know where he's getting it from and if we can buy it by the liter because nothing seems to slow him down i've got no idea how he writes as quick i've got no idea how he writes so well my th my thought is that his iq must be over 200 and that <laughs> is the one and only clive bates clive how are you sir well i'm, I'm feeling very flattered dave thank you that's quite unnecessary um, as, as unnecessary as it was, it's true. It is absolutely true. We have, I think, two of the most powerful figures in the whole of this world of e-cigs, neither of whom is a vapor, per se. Neither of whom is a vapor. And I, I, before we go any further, I actually do want, on behalf of absolutely everybody, I'm sure, I want to say a big thank you to the pair of you for for mentoring we mere mortals through all of this lot and for guiding us and keeping us right and, and putting the brakes on when they need it and you know reassuring us when we need it as well. I think without the guidance from you two particularly we could well have been lost in a mire of legalese red tape and a stench that comes out of the warren that is Brussels. So that's just there from me and I'm seeing Sav reading all sorts of stuff. Have you got stuff already? Chat that just echoing everything that you've just said and uh, Jerry and Clive are getting huge thanks for everything that they've done so far from our chat. I, I, I think it's I think it's richly deserved. Richly deserved. Thank you, gentlemen. Um but shall we uh, shall we do the show and play some titles and stuff like that and actually do a proper show instead of just backslapping all the way around. Well it's not backslapping, you know what I mean. I mean it is actually meant. It, it, it is actually perfectly meant. Um, so this, ladies and gentlemen uh, of the jury, is VT Talk. And we are live so, and talking about the Tobacco Products Directive um, and where it's at now. Clive, you've just put a blog up, haven't you, all, yep. uh, all about what's going on. Um, we don't want people to go and read it now for obvious reasons, no. but can, no. can you give us a quick gist of what's in there? Yeah, I mean, um, basically it reflects comments that I sent to the MEPs who were negotiating the amendment earlier in the week. Um, they, they produced this amendment on Friday um, 
and I sent them some comments first thing on Monday morning, which were about the things that people have been picking up on Twitter. You know, why have um, why have a threshold at 30 milligrams per milliliter? What's that for? Completely counterproductive as far as I can see. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't help people who, le- who like a stronger mix. It doesn't help the people who mix things. Um, it'll lead to a black market. It certainly won't do anybody any good. So it's just a pointless thing that's been inserted into the directive to kind of appease people who uh, are obsessive about regulation. There's a couple of other things that are worrying in the amendment. One is the um, the use of the restrictions that there are on tobacco advertising and applying those to e-cigarettes. Turns out those directives, although they, they sound quite, they, they sound a bit innocuous because they're to do with um, cross-border advertising. It turns out in the case of tobacco that those are um, defined very widely. So a printed publication, for example, could be sold in, made in one member state, but sold in another. So that would be regarded as cross, cross-border advertising, at least as I understand it. I mean, this directive came in after I left Ash, so I don't know it that well. Um, and there's no, obviously there's no point in having this great sort of product that you want people to use instead of smoking if you can't advertise it, if you can't build brands that will beat off the tobacco brands. So that's a bit stupid. Um, there's also... It, They've also added in an awful lot of extra bureaucracy, basically, that mean that will add costs and burdens, not as bad as medicines regulation by any means at all. So that's on the good side, um, you know, but it's just they've just not written a very good piece of legislation. On the upside, and this is the other side of the blog, though, we aren't in a position now where we will only have medicines regulation, at least if this amendment passes and that gets ultimately finds its way into the final directive. So I'm trying to be positive about that. Um, We've now got something much better than we had before, but we don't have something that you could call particularly good, if you see what I mean. So it's progress, um, but it's it's not what you would want to write. And then the final thing that I've said really is that it's not over yet. First of all, this has to get agreed on um, uh, on the 8th, and it's essential that it does. Mm-hmm. Make no mistake about that. Anybody who thinks we're better off striking it down is wrong because it adds an additional pathway uh, to medicines regulation. It doesn't take the medicines route away, so it's, it's progress. And it opens up the debate in the council and between the council and the parliament. Um, and we could make progress through that that we wouldn't have otherwise have made. So it's all advance, it's all progress. Most important of all, I think, is the change in understanding and recognition that there's been amongst the MPs, um, MEPs rather, uh, that medicines regulation is inappropriate. They are finally getting it. Yes. And that, that is a huge breakthrough. And that's more important in a way than the changes in the in the text. And of course, Paul Linda McAvan, you know, who we all uh, know and love, has been rather sidelined by all this. And it's actually quite embarrassing for a, um, uh, for a rapporteur to have one of her key recommendations um, kind of sort of turfed out in, in this way, if it, go, if it goes through. Yes, it's, uh, I have to admit, I've been heartened by what I, I, I saw today. And I, and I do echo your feeling that the, uh, the major part of this, the bit that we've really got to welcome with open arms, is the fact that these amendments actually protect e-cigs. Um, I've, I've thought for quite a while and I've sought advice from, from various different uh, MEPs that if the Tobacco Products Directive was just thrown out, where would that leave e-cigs? And my feeling is, and I'm awaiting proper confirmation on this, it might even come in chat, but the MHRA has said if TPD gets kicked out, I think, they'll, uh, they'll go along and just carry on with the medicinalisation of e-cigs. Can I Actually, Dave, that? you, Actually, you can't Dave, I think that's right. Well, hang on, Sav's got something. Yeah, because this was brought up in chat that Alan Fletcher was saying, wouldn't it be better just to drop e-cigs completely? To which John Spring um, from Echo has responded, dropping e-cigs completely would then leave the MHR free to pursue their own meds agenda. That's that's the bit that worries me. Jerry, do you know anything about about how that would work? 
Well, in terms of the MHRA? Yeah. Well, it, it, there's a lot of subtlety, I think, in the MHRA position. Um, although, you know, there's a statement about bringing everything under medicines regulation by whenever, 2016, 2017. If you, if you look at what they're saying, they're actually hitching their fortunes very much to the... Um, uh, to the, the TPD, so it gives them a bit of a, a let out, I think, yeah. uh, to, to backtrack. And I think, you know, I think maybe clients view as well that they, they do have a sort of get out of jail option here, and we need to try to pursue that. And we also need to try to work on our erstwhile colleagues who advised MHRA to help them to come to. Uh, a, 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 uh, uh, yeah, uh, to move away from med I think that's beginning to happen with yes. some of the advisors from HRA. But as ever, once people are committed down a particular route, you've got to give them ways to get out of that route without losing face. Yes. Well, Clive, you've you've dealt with the MHRA rather more than the rest of us put together. I would have thought. What's what's your? I mean, do you think that they would continue and, and press on for med regs if the well, TPD got thrown? Um. I think they'd have a policy rethink. To be honest, I mean, I don't know the I don't know the MHRA that well. I, remember, I do I know them from years ago. Uh, the interesting thing, if you look at their position, they are not saying we will regulate e-cigarettes as medicines. They are not saying that. What they're saying is the European Union directive would ban anything that wasn't licensed as a me an e-cigarette that wasn't licensed as a medicine. Yes. So. The coercive part of the legislation is in the EU side of it, and they can't be held responsible for that. So what they do is say, look, there's this EU regulation that says, EU directive that says if you're not licensed as a medicine, um, you know, you can't be on the market. So come to us and we can talk about licensing you a medicine if you want to. OK, so they're not saying we're forcing you to do that. They're saying if you want to be on the market, the EU has made it so that you have to come and have a conversation with us. So they're using subtle language like e-cigarettes are capable of being regulated as medicines. If they had to be regulated as medicines, then the question is why are they all on the market at the moment? The, the, you know, the MHRA should be, if they are medicines, should be taking them all off the market, but they're not doing that for obvious reasons. So they've got this very weasel worded language. And if anyone wants to see how this works in practice, have a look at the Q&A on their website and have a look at question 25, um, because it sort of it sort of shows how they're sort of ducking around the issue at the moment. What they haven't said anywhere is if the if the tobacco products directive doesn't regulate these products as medicines or doesn't ban them if they're not medicines to be more more precise that they will come in and do that and they must be noticing that courts around europe aren't buying that definition um so they've got a much more legally robust position or one that they're not responsible for if it's the eu that just bans anything that doesn't have medicines regulation but of course the CETA's um, legal advice from Francis Jacobs uh, QC says that that's probably unlawful and would be struck down by the Court of Justice so as Jerry says it's subtle and it isn't as straightforward as the MHRA saying these are medicines and we will regulate them as such come hell or high water hmm I, I do know that there have uh, there's, there's been some ha huh. Got my cameras wrong, I told you. My head's not working at all today. Um, I, I do know that there's been some inquiries made and, and, and rumour I'm hearing is that MHRA has been quite bullish about everything being medicines and I don't quite understand why that is. It, 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 and it does kind of lead me to believe, that, well, let's, let's assume first off that next week goes according to Hoyle and that the votes go our way, non-meds, that uh, the, the Aldi amendment goes through and, and France today has thrown its backing fully behind it. Not just the vapors, but also the anti-tobacco, anti-smoking organization in France. They put their full weight behind it. Mm. I'm waiting for Cancer Research UK and ASH to do the same here. I'm not holding my breath, but no. I, th I think it's time they did. If, I'm, if, if anybody from Cancer Research UK is watching, you had the right position in 2007-2008. You had the right position. The idea then 
was even to take NRT out of medicines regulation because patently it's a lifestyle choice. It's not a bloody medicine. No way can you treat an addiction to a substance by giving people that substance. That's never going to work. Um, so you held the right position. Get them out of med regs. You need to be holding that again today. And Ash, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that's actually what they think. I think they're towing a line, but I don't know whose line they're towing. So yeah, France has gone that way. Be nice to see Ash and Cancer Research UK go that way. Jerry, do you think there's much chance of that? I, I don't at the higher level in Ash. I don't think we get such a statement. And many, you know, Ash and many of the people that supported Meds Regs have sort of gone to ground recently. You know, Clive and I have been tossing out things in their direction that were met mainly by um, a, an amazing silence. Uh, I, 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 Ash is a, is a, is a problem. Uh, Ash England and Ash Scotland are a problem at the top. Not so interestingly enough when you talk to people at other levels within those organisations who sort of sad to say, you know, they have to toe the party line for those organisations and there's a, a much more sympathetic view on e-cigs and, and anti-meds regs you can detect amongst other people. Well, I don't see that CRUK are going to come out with anything other than we must support a strong TPD. TPD is going to save Europe from smoking. It's going to save young people from smoking. I think Ash are going to say the same. I mean, they're not going to look at the subtleties of the bits and pieces in there. CRUK has all been, been tweeting over the last 24, 48 hours, throw your weight behind TPD. So they're not going to exercise um, what we would hope to be a, a more subtle and a more dif differentiated position. It's going to be for the CRUK, T, TPD or, or, uh, at all costs. Ash, as I said, I don't, I don't think they're going to... Um, I, I think they're in a the corner because um, Deborah has so strongly argued the case for med regs over the last couple of years that it's very difficult now to back away from that. It, it, that's something that I find interesting, actually, because there are there are many uh, public health experts, uh, uh, as as you've already mentioned, that have changed their position almost 180 degrees. That are very supportive of e-cigs and have come to the conclusion, rightly in my opinion, that medicinal regulation for e-cigs is actually counterproductive. Um, I mean, I, you know, I've I've got to say that that. that of Clive, really, coming from the background of, of being the director of ASH. I, I wasn't expecting that you would have taken that view at the very <laughs> first. <laughs> well, you, you, know, you don't know though, Dave. I mean, I was, I was the first director of ASH to advocate legalising drugs, uh, illicit drugs as well. So um, I've never been quite cut from quite the same cloth as the, the, normal, uh, the normal previous ASH directors. I, I think you know, the problem is there are some, there's some nice people out there, they're good people, they're good clinicians, they're good campaigners, they're John Britton, Martin Jarvis, Deborah Arnott, Paul Aviard, you know, they, 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 they believe they're doing good, but they got stuck in this tunnel or this funnel of med regs very early on, thinking, you know, it would make things better, that we get better products, but these people don't actually know much about and markets, they don't know much about consumers, they don't know much about, you know, as I've said before, they, they've got no strategy for engaging with this new community of, of vapors. So they're kind of in a funny little tobacco control cocoon, um, which kind of led them down this path. And I think, you know, some of them are now regretting it. But how can they be enabled to? Kind of say well, they're not going to say they're wrong, but you need to you need always in negotiations to find a, a good let out for people so that they can change without you know, without losing face. I mean, they're not bad people, but they just made bad decisions. Yes, I mean, years and years ago, I did a little bit of sales training, and part of that that training was to discover what people's objections were to a purchase. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, was, it was called, strangely enough, handling objections. And once you've handled them all and made whatever concessions are, are necessary in order to make them happy, then there is no reason for them to buy other than, and this I always thought was funny, they just don't like you. 
That, that was the way it went. And I'm just wondering how many objections we've got to handle with some of these people. We're going to take a quick blast of adverts. And when we come back, I, I think I want to talk about Martin McKee a little bit. Because, well, anybody that's on Twitter and who's read Clive's amazing response to Mr. McKee will know why I find it interesting. Um, so we will be back in just a couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere. This is going to be fascinating. in Yorkshire for your basic needs. That's iVeber.co.uk and iVeber-elixir.co.uk. iVeber and iVeber-elixir.co.uk are proud sponsors of VeberTrails.tv. And we are back in the room here on Wednesday, the 2nd of October, with uh, in the usual place, Sav, with Jerry Stimson and with uh, with Clive. And we're going to go straight to Sav because she's got she's got blisteringly good stuff coming out of chat. Our chat is the best in the world. What we got, Sav? All right, I'll start from way back. <laughs> Mark Shaw said, "In my opinion, the Aldi compromises are admitting the whole thing is a farce, but they have to be seen to be doing something." Mm -hmm. FMRL says, I'm a bit wary of the five-year stay of execution in the amendment. Cerulean C has said, I think they have to compromise to get swears on board. Blaze had said he's reassured a little bit by the amendment. Tartan thinks got a question. He says, does the MHRA apply for all of the UK? Asking because NHS England and Wales is entirely separate from NHS Scotland. That's a good question. I don't know. We'll think on that one and, and handle it. Okay, John Springer said, got an email from Linda McEvan today in which she said, should there be no regulation at EU level, there is nothing to stop the UK or other countries from going ahead with their own laws. She also said, it is the UK government's policy that e-cigarettes should be regulated as medicines. Right. Can we, do we take, I think we should take that one. Yeah. We'll take that one. Now, first off, I'm going to say this. She's Labour. She's a socialist. What the hell is she doing agreeing with what she sees as being the UK government stance? Her job's to oppose that, number one. Two, they can do that, can't they? If there is no regulation, in other words, if the TPD gets hiked out, there's nothing to stop them from trying it on. Jerry, do you want to take that one first? No, there's nothing to stop any country proceeding with um, with their own policy on this. So she's correct, but that email seems to be quite amazing because it's recognising the strong possibility that the E6 part of the TPD might collapse. Oh, I hadn't, it, I hadn't it? picked that up. Well, it is. I mean, why would you send an email out like that? It's almost giving up, isn't it? Saying, look, you know, it might fail there, but we can still do it back home or in other countries, get on with it. 
um, we can do it regardless of, um, of, of, of EU and TPD. It seems to be a, an early admission of defeat. Quite, quite an odd email. It is a bit, and it, and it does, it kind of feeds into the, the hissy fit that apparently she had in Envy Committee. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like saying, I'm going to get my dad onto you. You know, it's, it's, it's that sort of juvenile, basically. Yeah. It, 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 it's, I mean, what she's saying there, she's, she's assuming that if the TPD falls, the underlying UK policy will um, be to regulate as medicines. But actually, the UK policy at the moment isn't to regulate as medicines, it's to use the EU directive, which bans anything that isn't a rate, that uh, bans any e cigarette that isn't regulated as a medicine. That's very different. At the moment, they are saying they don't, they don't have the power to regulate um, all e cigarettes as medicines by function. You know, and that's why they're not taking them all off the market at the moment. So they, they would have to change their, they would have to change their stance and become much more confident that they can actually regulate these things legally as medicines, which is not where they're at at the moment. So she, she may well be misreading the slightly subtle, slightly defensive position that the UK has adopted on this directive. It's, a, it's an interesting... Go on, Jerry. But sorry. Also politically, I mean, if TBD, no. if it collapses on on medregs for e cigs, it it then it gives us a huge you know, power to go back to the UK government. I mean, it really weakens the UK government position if 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 it's not medregs in Europe. So it really does begin to make you know give, give a huge opportunity to make inroads into the MHRA position. Even you know, and as Clive says. They've already hedged their bets because they've linked their fortunes to TPD, and they can always say, "Well, you know, um, we don't have to go down this route as, as strongly as as might be thought because you know we've now got the option to do it in, in, in different ways." So it really begins the whole thing begins it potentially to fall, fall apart. Yeah. The, the other thing is is that you see other member states, you know, they they've been sort of hectored into this. Um, medicines regulation thing. I mean, the UK has been driving this along. Um, you know, UK UK um, activists and academics really pushed the case during the Commission's co consultation on this in 2010. The Commission didn't even propose medicines regulation. Not a lot of people know that. That what the Commission proposed was performance and quality standards for yes. e-cigarettes, which is actually not a bad idea. Um, but what they got back was a torrent of um, responses from the public health community saying, oh, treat them like medicines. And the origin of that was in the approach that was taken in the UK. Um, so I, I think, actually, if the parliament rejects medicines regulation, it might embolden some of the other member states. And we also know that the, we already know that the government of France, not just the uh, vapors and the anti-tobacco organization but the government has also entered a reservation on medicines regulation it did that during the council meeting back in june mm -hmm. it did and I, and I believe um judging by what i've read from the evidence that anna Subri submitted and documents linked to from that that there are not official reservations but there are also reservations on behalf of other countries and that, that in fact she she had to do what she did to get what she wanted because if she hadn't have done it, it would have been stymied that's that's the reading I've, yeah. I've got of it i don't know whether have you got any more detail on that jerry or clive no no i haven't no. i don't know what she was what she says what she was trying to get the some the weird art i mean basically the thing that she seemed to be focused on was getting the article that allows the uk to go further than the eu directive which, when you think about it, is slightly mad in a directive that's there to harmonise things for um, single market purposes, which is what this is. But what she was determined to do was to protect that, which would allow them to continue the conversation they were having about plain packaging, standardised packaging, call it, call it what you will. So she was focused on that, and that's where all the sort of political excitement was. It's you know, it's nothing like as important as the approach to regulating e-cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, or all the other harm reduction alternatives. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole, I've got to be honest, I've sat and read this thing from back to front. I've got no idea how many times now, but it's more than I would care to count and more than I care to mention. And the more I read it, the more I think they're just tiddling about on the, on the periphery. Um, 
I think they've been, and I'm going to pinch some of Clive's rhetoric here, I think, I think they've been anything but ambitious to aim for a 2% reduction in prevalence. Um, <laughs> Good Lord, oh no, sorry, a 2% uh, reduction in consumption. Yeah, yeah. Which is um, statistically insignificant when it comes to the percentage, the prevalence of the number of people using. Right. Um, I mean, the, the, the whole notion of banning menthol <laughs> is not going to stop the kids from buying fags. It just isn't. Because they won't buy menthol, they'll buy Marlboro, other types of cigarette are available of course um, they'll just buy them in fact if they go down the plain packaging route the kids will buy the cheapest which is what they already do um, so plain packaging waste of time menthol waste of time slims so I'm gonna come to Sav on this one because because oh. you're a girl I am last time I looked mm -hmm. and your mum's a girl she is slims Talk to me about them, because it, it, it's not a million years ago that you were looking at, at, at fags and using fags. I mean, we, would you buy things that look like a lipstick or no. not? If I wanted the lipstick, I'd buy a lipstick. If I wanted a cigarette, I'd buy a cigarette, and the two never cross over in my mind. What, what, about, uh, what about packaging that, that looks like a lipstick? I, I still kind of get my head around this at all. I'm a bloke and I'm thick. I mean, I walk into a shop when I wanted cigarettes and I'd go, I'd have them once because they were the price that were right for me. I didn't care if they were in a pink packet with flowers on, if they were in a black packet with the devil written on it. I don't care. Okay, so I, I can take it from that that you are a proper girl, not a daft girl like Anna Soubry, who apparently bought St. Moritz because they were a pretty colour in her. I've seen it. All these packets, we got ones with purple flowers on and ones with yellow flowers on. And was I ever tempted to buy them? No, never, ever. I mean, I was a menthol smoker. So the only thing I ever looked for on a packet is, does it have green on? Because green means menthol. <laughs> yeah. I well, didn't care about flowers or slims or whatever. Well, didn't care. If, if uh, and I'll put the other question to you, uh, uh, because I've... I've you're one of two people I know that ever smoked menthol only. If you couldn't have got menthol, would you bought Marley's or Embassy yep. Number no. One or Regal or whatever? Yep. Okay, so that one's not going to work, then, is it? No. Nope. Well, I mean, Clive, you've uh, you've described this whole TPD as a dog's breakfast, and I have the feeling that you were being polite at the time. I have to correct you there, uh, Dave. Actually, I've described it as a gargantuan dog's breakfast. Ah, right. So not quite so polite then. No. I, what, I just can't get my head around it, to be honest. I, I, I think it's, um, it's faffing about looking for somewhere to happen. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that they weren't expecting that people would be up in arms about e things. I, th I think yeah. that I think they thought it was going to be a minor part, that it was a done deal, and there'd be no yeah. objection to it. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I, I think this has been off their radar, and I thought the most actually, although the uh, Anna Soubry's um, performance in front of the that um, European Scrutiny Committee was, you know, hilarious in many ways. The most the most interesting part of it was that she didn't actually know whether e-cigarettes were in or out of the directive. And you, you, only, you only are confused about that if you're not focused on it. So she mustn't have been really, that must not have been front of mind, even as recently as uh, June or where, where, whenever it was that that happened. Mm. Um, and therefore they've not really understood that this is the most significant part of this directive by miles. You know, the, the, the success or otherwise of e-cigarettes will completely dwarf those other measures. Um, I mean, we can argue about whether they are negative, mildly positive, mildly or, or neutral in, in sort of impact on consumption. But whatever they are, they're going to be tiny relative to the potential in, impact that e-cigarettes would have on the category, uh, on the cigarette category as a, a, as a whole. And you're not, you, if you listen to, if you, 
you know, if you always want to know what's going on, don't don't listen to the public health academics. Listen to the investment alan, a, analysts. Yeah. See what Wells Fargo is saying. See what Morgan Stanley is saying. See what Citibank is saying. They're not really discussing, you know, um, the ban on menthol. Obviously, the ban on menthol has specific impacts on specific companies in specific uh, countries. But in general, they don't see that as a big issue. The, inter the thing that's interesting them from a regulatory point of view at the moment is what happens on e-cigarettes because they see that as the big challenge to the cigarette franchise and that's the thing that's going to shake up who are you know who is the big dog in the tobacco industry yes and and it and it is it is noticeable too because I've been reading some of the analyses on these they are um, and I, I don't know the technical term for it but basically that they're, they're putting bigger prices uh, and bigger buy recommendations on the companies that are getting into e-cigs, the tobacco companies that are yeah, getting into e-cigs. Yeah, that's e right. That's yeah. right. I mean, um, Lorillard, the American company that's just bought uh, Sky6, actually yesterday, um, they, they, are a, they are a very big favourite of the um, analyst community in the United States at the moment, the investment analyst community, not obviously the public health people. Um, because they've got a very aggressive play with the blue um, cigarettes, which not I don't think are available in, in the UK, but they're doing incredibly well. They're growing like mad. They're making a lot of money. They're getting better margins and their, their market share is growing. So, you know, the analysts look at that and think, well, that's where the action is. Um, the public health people look at it and go... And the, the, the analysts will say things like, that's, that's 1.5 billion cigarettes not sold. And the, the public health people look at it and go, oh, well, that might lead to dual use or, um, you know, gateway effects or all these other things that are mainly fab fabrications of their febrile imaginations. Well, well that before we go flying further down that route, I yeah. want to throw it to a public health academic who's sitting with us, to Jerry, um, <laughs> because how do you view the tobacco companies getting involved in, in, in e-cigs and how do you view the effect that that's going to have on, in big letters, the public health, Jerry? Well, I think to go back to that question of ambition first, uh, as you know, the TPD impact analysis suggests a 2% decline in consumption over five years, the whole TPD package. And from a public health point of view, that's, that's pretty pathetic. Uh, if you look at the um, Morgan Stanley analysis, they showed, I, I think in the last year, e-cigs have contributed to 1% of the decline in tobacco sales in the US. That's without, you know, any public health input, without any public health campaigns and all the rest of it. That's happening. And, you know, that that is going to be where the major push is. And, you know, unfortunately, public health academics just don't get it. And they also don't get the role that the tobacco industry will play. Now, I know that you and a lot of the people watching tonight are very, you know, enamored with nice, shiny, chrome-plated big things. But also, we've got to think that, you know, vaping machines, but also we've got to think that, you know, going bigger, not just in the, not in the machines, but in the, in the market volume is going to be very important. So I, I, I am interested and quite sympathetic to tobacco companies getting into the e-cig um, market. And I think there are different markets here and they, from a public health point of view, the more people in the game, the more being sold, the better. You may say, well, they're not going to be as good as what you use, but nevertheless, they're going to work for some people. Second point is, it's clear that the tobacco companies are, are a bit on the run. I mean, Clive and I refer to it as sort of the Kodak moment, uh, where you know, they don't really get caught out that five years down the line, you know, Kodak are caught out by digital, digital cameras, couldn't sell film anymore. None of them want to get caught out by not being able to get into the e-cig um, market. So they're, they're rushing into it. Now, that's all for the good, because if their analysis say that in rich countries, they're going to be stuffed in the long run in terms of tobacco sales, tobacco sales are declining. They need to diversify. It you know, makes commercial sense to move across. So from a public health point of view, there's a, a double benefit here because they see that you know, their tobacco 
um, sales are declining, they're being pushed more into the e-cig. Well, that, that's good. You know, people in tobacco control have argued for the end of the industry. Well, that will never happen. But if we can help transform the industry by getting them shunted in a different yeah. direction, by selling e-cigs, putting effort into that, you know, they're alongside the cigarettes and the, you know, the, the tobacco cigarettes in the shops. All for the good. You're seeing the decline of a traditional foul product. It's only been with us 100, 120 years or so. Uh, the, the tobacco cigarette was transformative when it was first uh, invented, the, the rolling machine invented by Bonsack. E-cigs, and, you know, you talk to um, executives in, in tobacco companies and, you know, I mean, you can see that they really like to be talking about this stuff all the time and not talking about the nasty yeah. cigarettes. So yeah. I think, exactly. yeah, there's, there's a lot of good that can come from this if, it, if it's played out right. It, you're absolutely right. I, and I agree with every word. And I've just realised we've got through to the second advert and I had promised to talk about Martin McKee. We haven't <laughs> managed yet. Um, we might get there in, in the third half. Sav, what we got from chat? Right, yes, before we go to the ads, I'll rattle through all the stuff I've got from chat, then you can go to the ads, then we can try and talk about Martin Mickey. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the producer? <laughs> yeah, well, you've got to put him in his place sometimes. <laughs> I, I get told what to do. Trust me on this one. I'm, I'm going to take some camera here. I do what I'm told. <laughs> Otherwise, Cat and Sav only live up the road yeah. and, and they're vicious when they're riled and I, yeah. I never upset them, never. Carry on, Sav. <laughs> right. Mark Shaw has said, there is one thing for sure that no matter what is brought in, not everyone will be happy, and that includes those for and against E6. Yep. Andy D has said, it's about time there was a body that represented all of vaping, one voice to hit them all, made up from retailers, the UK manufacturers, and the vapers and the vapers' body as well. Joe Lincoln has said, I get the feeling they can't deal with seeing people do something they enjoy without consequences. Mm -hmm. Andy Day also said, sorry, there is no compromise that's acceptable. It's win or lose. E-cigs are not smoking, do not fall under smoking laws, and they are not medicines, so don't fall under meds regs. I see no way any compromise can be considered without telling the lie that vaping falls under one or other of those options. To which Leanna Lawless said, agree, but they do it because it will bring more MEPs and MPs on board. Roger Hall says, how can the MHRA class E6 as medicines when they've already admitted are totally wicked that they currently are not medicines? Mm -hmm. Joseph K says, if the TPD fails to regulate E6 as medicines by function in the U, the UK has to follow the MPD as is, meaning only med medicinal by presentation, surely. Yes. Yep. Whip it up 69 says, I have a horrible feeling that the E6 thing will get chucked out of the TPD and we will end up fighting this whole thing again here in the UK. Mark Shaw has said, as strict regs are looming, the big players are quietly moving into the market. Doug Phillips says, I think this is the first time that a subject like E6 has been talked about so much on the internet, Twitter, Facebook, etc. And the MPs, MEPs don't know what's hit them. Power to the people is a phrase that comes to mind. Totally. And Yes. Finally, Andy D says again, why go for an unacceptable and unneeded compromise when it is clearly not needed? Stop looking for the easy option and go for the right option. History should have taught folk appeasement never works. Mm. Well, well okay. I, I, you know, I, I, I've, got, I've got so much sympathy with that last statement um, yeah. and, and with other statements where it's not right. What, what concerns me more than anything else is that if we don't get protection for e-cigs for now and the now is a vanishingly small amount of time that we're talking about if we get that protection voted through in plenary it means and i think this is quite important that the parliament the commission and the council do not agree they'll have three very separate stances mm. parliament will be saying they're not medicines unless they're presented as medicines. The commission will be saying they're not medicines if they are two milligrams or under, but they are if they're over, because they still haven't changed that. And the council will be going, they're all bloody medicines. So there'll be three completely separate views. That means there's more time and room for negotiation. But if Parliament has come through and said, we do not consider 
that these things should be regulated as medicinal devices or a medicinal liquid, then I, I think there's, there's a fair amount of weight there and it gives us a lot more time to do what I'm going to ask you to do in the third half. I'll probably do that before we talk about Martin McKee. Martin, if, if you're watching, honestly, seriously, no, we, we will get to talk about you because I know that's what you want. But for I the hear moment, he's a fan. Eh? I hear he's a fan. Is he? Oh, uh, oh, oh sorry, I thought you said funny. Um, no, I can't agree with that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we'll go to the ads, and, and seriously, Martin, we will, we'll, I'll, I'll, I know, you, trust me, I'm not a doctor. And we, we go live just as Clive returns from answering the door to Martin McKee, whose broadband's gone down, so he's unable to watch us live at the moment. He'd just come to borrow 50 pence from the meter uh, so that he could get his broadband back up. Um, it, it's, it's, but Sav, I, I, I'm sorry, Martin, we're going to have to put you off a little bit because Sav's got something from chat. Sav? Yeah, this came in earlier from Alan Fletcher and he says, I heard tonight that the German Christian Democrats, the CDU and the Liberals, the FDP, will be pushing for a compromise. No medicine but tobacco product, plus the definition of all emissions. The latter would still take most variable vape mods off the market. Okay, can I handle this one, gentlemen? Um, because I have, I have such equipment here. I think what we've got to bear in mind here that up until very, very recently, and this is very, very recently, MEPs, whether they were EPP, Aldi, whatever, were unaware that anything other than sticks, cigar likes, and egos mm. were available. They have no clue what mods are. If everything goes through the way it's planned, the, 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 um, the amendment that, that, that Aldi and EPP are supporting, and that I think gives them the majority anyway, together with ECR it's bound to, um, that allows everything that we know in terms of the basal products, if you like. Currently with a limit of 30 milligrams, yeah, I like 45, but there'll be no limit, I don't think, on buying from the United States of Americania or places like that. So I'm not too worried by that. I can get what I want. That's not going to be too much of a problem. There's not going to be a ban order placed on it if this all goes through as we're currently planned. When it comes down to Genesis atomizers and, and, and this kind of thing, um, I don't think it represents a problem because what they'll have to do is test the juice in a GCMS machine with a standardized piece of equipment which is going to approximate more closely uh, a cigar like or an ego than it will a, a cracking on top of a K 
kicked GGTS for argument's sake. So as long as the juice passes in the standardised test machine, it goes out onto the market. That's the emissions that they've got to tell them about. Um, and I don't even think it's a pass or fail. I think they've just got to be notified. Is that how you understand Article 17, um, Clive? It's a notification procedure, and you, ha you have to basically provide information. On, I mean, it is, it's, it's full of things that don't really work for emission, uh, sorry, things that don't really work for e-cigarettes, as you say. Um, but it's all, you know, basically all the saying is give us all the information you've got and, and all the information we require and you can go on the market. So, I mean, one of the anomalies in the, in the you know, in the dog's breakfast of the tobacco products directive was that you could put a low risk nicotine product on the market much more easily if it contained tobacco than if it didn't. You know, Article 16 is much easier to deal with than the Commission's proposal for Article 18. Yes, yes. And of course, Article 15, the most ridiculous of all, takes the safest possible tobacco product and bans it, which is the ban on snus. Just stupid. I, 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 I tried snus, thanks to Jerry, uh, yesterday for the first time. And, uh, yeah, I, not, not, not to my taste, I've got to say it, but it, it worked. It definitely worked, and I'm still walking about and breathing. I haven't died. Um, that's my phrase of the moment is safe enough, and I think yeah, that's right. That's right. It, it's absolutely ridiculous in in my mind that the the EU sought to ban snus in the first place, and still sticks to this completely idiotic notion in the face of all the evidence that it still needs to be banned. But, you know, such is life, such is life. And it is popular with particular groups. You know, it's popular in Northern Europe, in Denmark, in Finland, in Sweden, in Estonia. It's also popular with particular types of um, users. So people, you know, people who like skiing or snowboarding, for example, use it. Used to actually be very popular in mining in, um, in uh, Britain. Yes. Um, you know, people like Kevin Barron, the MP who's, you know, one of the strongest anti-tobacco guys, actually used to be a snus user when he was a miner. Um, well, I, I can go back to, to my granddad's day. And uh, I actually went down his pit. He was a, a deputy overman down the pit. And uh, when I was 21, he took me down. And uh, by that time, I'm, I've been smoking in front of everybody for God knows how long. And, and, and I do excuse me, gentlemen, because you will not understand a word of what I'm about to say, but there'll be somebody will translate in chat, I'm sure. When we were going down, he says, Mine, son, they can't attack the tabs down with it, nay light and nay matches, they'll get frisked, it's contraband and ass. And I said, Okay. He says, But don't worry, I've got some pigtail with us. And you just kind of, your eyes opened and you'd pigtail, what the hell's that? And when we got down there, he got his little deputy's knife out and he cut us a wadge of moist, compressed tobacco that was plaited, like a twist. And he says, just shove that between you, your lip and your gum, son. They'll be all right, because we're going to be down here eight hours. So I did, and it tasted absolutely foul. Um, if Johnny Lavery's in chat, have him type in what it tastes like. He has a description for it, which I'm sure is absolutely bang on. And, and yes, it is. It's kind of salty and slightly gooey. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go any further than that. But it did the job and it worked. And that was, how long ago was that? 21, maybe 37 years ago. Um, and up until yesterday, I'd never tried it before. It works. It's there. I can't see any reason at all why that should be the way it is and i think that's uh once once we've we've seen the e-cigs i'm, I'm going to be with clive and i think we should have a go at this clive well it's we are doing i mean um jerry me and um eight other um actually kind of quite eminent european uh academics just written to um all meps on this saying it's just completely preposterous and i, I, te I tell you why it's important to understand the snooze case dave um, when snus was banned in 1992, the main reason for it, people said, oh, gateway effect. It could lead to more people smoking. It could trap kids and everything. Okay. Um, 
basically they threw up all the same objections that they're throwing up to e-cigarettes now. The really interesting thing to know, and this is why it strengthens the e-cigarette case, is that even though evidence in the intervening 20 years have shown that all of that was complete rubbish, and in fact the effect of snus in Sweden was protective, it actually diverted people away from smoking and displaced cigarette smoking, exactly as we would expect e-cigarettes to do, they still haven't, they still actively support banning snus. So at, at the heart of it, the snus case study shows a sort of massive hypocrisy that there is around these things. They make out it's all about evidence and real concern, but when you show beyond all reasonable doubt that there is no reason to be concerned and actually something like snus is beneficial at a population level, they still don't change their position. And that's because their underlying position is essentially prohibitionist. They think that they've got a prohibition on snus and that's part way of the way towards a full prohibition on tobacco. That's what's basically going, they don't articulate it like that, but that's what's basically going on. So I say to them on, on e-cigarettes, I'm sorry, I can't believe anything you say until you change your position on snus. And they don't really have an answer. No. And I think that's probably because there isn't a logical one or one that, that actually holds any water. And that kind of leads me to the point, really. Um, if we sit back and we allow the Tobacco Products Directive to go through and don't make our voices heard so that the Aldi Amendment is supported in the face of dummies being thrown out of prams, rattles being chucked out, nappy taken off and the crap wiped up the wall, you know who I'm talking about, and it's not Martin McKee. Um, if we sit back and we don't and we don't make sure, if we don't chivy our MEPs up to make sure that the Aldi Amendment is supported all the way through to the end, it's going to be very, very difficult to reverse any decision that's made where med regs are given the big tick. So, Jerry, what do we need to do? We need to get back into gear and get email into MEPs. Uh, everybody will have had a lot of this and getting a bit tired of it, but we've got six days to go. And the emails, the personal testimonies, they all count. They're, they're far more powerful than all the reasoned arguments. You know, the testimony about what these e have done for me is, is important. So you've got to get that across. You've got to get across the the support Aldi or the no to med regs, you know, simple message that the whole thing's going to be messed up if we go down the med regs route. Um, I also think it's time to throw out the, uh, you know, who's going to vote for you. You know, if you vote for uh, med regs, think of, you know, what's going to happen in the European elections next um, spring or whenever they are. So, but I think the, the message is, you know, just get going again. Don't just tweet to each other, which is great. Um, tweet your MEP, email your MEP, just um, go you know, full-hearted at it over the next few days just so that they are reminded yet again of the disaster that will come if med regs goes through. Indeed. Clive, you anything to add to that? No, I think Jerry's totally right, basically. I mean, I mean, I think the first thing to do, though, just remember how far we've come. You yeah. know, if you looked at this in February, it looked like a done deal. It looked like everybody was sort of lined up around medicines regulation. The, the governments, the, um, the MEPs, everybody, nobody really understood anything of this. And they thought medicines regulation is a neat, neat way of doing it. They have been incredibly affected by the, uh, by the communication they've had from the vaping community. Mm. In person, by email, by tweets, whatever. It has worked. And, and in the course of doing that, it's created champions for us in the, in the European Parliament, like Rebecca Taylor, Chris Davis, Martin Kalanen, um, Chris, uh, Christopher Engstrom, and some of those other, um, you know, uh, Christopher Fellner, and some of those yeah. other guys that are really, um, really pushing it out there. So it, it has been a brilliant campaign so far. But people shouldn't, people shouldn't give up any sort of hope. We've made great progress. But it's not over until the ink is dry on the settled agreement. Um, on This will happen on October the 8th. Hopefully we'll get the amendment agreed. Everybody needs to really focus on that until October the 8th. 
on October the 9th, the next phase starts. And that's to the member state governments. And believe me, that'll be more fun because that's that's about your MEPs, about ministers. Uh, it's about a real pressure on them to undo this position they've got on medicines regulation. And I think, you know, if we if we get the right result in Parliament, they will be scratching their heads and wondering if they are doing the right thing and whether it was right for ministers to, you know, always trust the dismal duo of black and mean. And, and actually they may, you know, they may decide that actually that was a bit of a mistake and we went down the wrong path in 2010. Yeah. Abs absolutely. Abs Jerry, you've got to come in on that one. The dismal duo. No, I, I can't. I can't beat that one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'm going to go to Sav in a minute, but before I do, to get the, to get chat in, because I do like chat to have the last word. But before I go there, going back a couple of weeks, I, I suggested that it would be a damn good idea on these emails, hand scrawled letters, whatever. Get your iPhone out, get a digital camera out, sit in front of your webcam. However you do it, don't care. But sit there with your favourite device in your hand, and I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter if it's a 134, if it's an Ego, if it's a Vibe. I couldn't give a monkey's what it is. Make sure you've got something in your hand. And take the picture so they can see you are a real person, that you exist, and the device that you're using is in your hand. That proves what you are and who you are. Don't forget to put your address in as well uh, for when you, you talk to your own MEP, because that kind of forces their hand a little bit as well. The one thing I would ask you not to do, if it's at all possible, and this is a plea from the heart, if you started on 36 and dropped to 18 and are now on 12, you don't need to tell them that. <laughs> Shut up, yeah. You, you just don't need to tell them that because that's what's known as cut down to quit and that unfortunately won't help. Um, it's a plea from the heart and what they don't know won't hurt them. That's all I'm going to say on that. Sav, it's over to you and chat. Well, first of all, I want to pass on, I got this message both from our very own cat and from Very Boring, who says, Chris Davis is tweeting that they are close to a majority for the amendment. Yes. Which is good. Um, I would love to read Jeff Benning's comment out, but I can't. I dare you. <laughs> Okay, Jeff Bennion says, I nearly got arrested for sending pictures of myself with my favourite device in my hand. <laughs> yeah, Jeff might have got the wrong end of the stick on that one. Uh, I bet I know who he sent it to. <laughs> <laughs> the last two comments, Craig Boots has said, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself on things, but I can't wait for this legislation to get behind us so we can start tackling these stupid and worrying bans based on fear, offence and... Uh, offence that might be taken or the fact that things are mistaken for smoking like yeah. the ban for taxi drivers that was implemented in the northwest yeah. today yes and the final word tonight is going to go to prodart 501 who says to be honest here we are all at the dawn of a new generation and it's not going to be an easy transition and all this fussing around by mps and meps with plain packaging menthol and slims etc is just their way of trying to make it look as if they're doing something about traditional cigarettes without actually doing anything significant to harm the market but that will change in time and we're not going anywhere and he's exactly right we're not we're not um, the time is now. This is the final countdown. Da -da -da -da. Da Never mind. No chair dancing tonight. It's not a done deal yet. But you've just heard that Chris Davis is tweeting, we've nearly got a majority. If we turn the taps on now, if we give it one last push, a big charge, and get that majority there, it puts us in the strongest position that we'll have been in since December the 19th, when this whole sorry Farago was launched. I'm going to go to close you up. You come on me for this, this little last bit. I am, I have to say, immensely proud to be part of a community of people that has taken what Clive described as what looked like a done deal in February, and by their efforts of emailing, tweeting, visiting, talking to and telephoning MEPs, their representatives in Europe, and this is for all Europeans, they've taken it from a situation where we had 
all of the support of a single strand of a spider's web and we now have very close to the majority of the European Parliament supporting our position and that's all happened because of your efforts. It's not down to me, it's not down to Clive, it's not down to Jerry, it's not down to anybody that's been sitting in front of these cameras over the last, God it's 10 months now. It's down to you. You've done this. You should be proud of yourselves. One last little push is all it's going to take. But let's make it the biggest push we can make. Let's send Twitter crackers. Let's get the email wires buzzing. Let's get those digital cameras going. Let's pull this together and win this fight. You can do it. Together, we can do it. And I'm so proud to be part of a community of people that's achieved that. I don't think I can say any more than that. Sav? I have to echo that and echo what chat are saying and chat are screaming out unanimously. Group hug. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I really, really hope that on the 9th we can all do a massive chair dance. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so looking forward to that. I think it's going to be crackers. Absolutely crackers. Clive um, and Jerry, I want to say a massive big thank you to the pair of you for coming along tonight and a massive big thank you for all the help that you've given all of us over these last however long it is. It seems like a lifetime. Um, I'm taking you at your word, Clive, that uh, working with the MPs is going to be a lot more fun than it has been with MEPs. The upside is we don't have to go to Brussels. Yeah, that is the upside. The downside is we still have to go to London. Oh, well, never mind. Um, but yeah, I want to I want to put a big vote, vote of thanks uh, to both of you for all the help that you've been, all the support that you've given and, and, and all of the inspiration that you give to the, the whole world of vape. And I think it's absolutely fabulous. Um, to everybody else out there that's watching the show, thank you so much for watching. You've got no idea how much it means to Sav, to Kat, to me, and, and the rest of the team here at Vapor Trails. Um, without you, there'd be absolutely no point in doing this. Um, and, and it probably would all have gone to hell in a handcart anyway. Um, I'm feeling slightly emotional at the minute because I, I, I feel we're on the verge of something really, really big. And that, I think, is probably a good point to say from all of us here, thank you so much for watching. Um, vape on. Vape hard, email on, email harder, and do not let the bastards grind you down. See you tomorrow. Night night. <laughs>